Thank you for joining me in this uh, protocol overview. Uh, basically, I'll provide uh, three main subjects. I'll cover the what's an electrical uh, SCADA protocol, the history of protocols, and the uh, communication protocols classification. In this first section, we're going to cover three topics. What's an electrical SCADA protocol? An example of a protocol encoding. And uh, finally, we'll talk about protocol layering. In an electrical supervisory control and data acquisition system, SCADA, uh, an IED, which stands for an intelligent electronic device in a substation, supervisory station, and control centers, communicate data and control message in a compact encoded signal over a physical communication media. The structure of the encoded signal is governed by a set of rules known as communication protocol. The communication could be a local to the substation, one device to another device in a substation, or uh, for an example, a data concentrator like the D20 collecting uh, data from a controller. Uh, this controller, bay controller, could be uh, controlling all the applications in a bay, or it could be over a wide geographic area where uh, you've got a, a concentrator communicating to a control center. Um, or it could be from one control center to another control center. Uh, for example, uh, a good protocol is the ICCP protocol, which stands for Enter Control Center Communication uh, Protocol. And uh, that would govern the communication between one control center to another control center. By governing the com communication, I mean that it will set the rules for how the message should look like between one control center device to another control center receiving device uh, at the other center. For example, in a substation, if we have uh, two devices, uh, one of the devices is acting as a master, like a D20 communicating to a UR relay, uh, the D20 needs to get a digital uh, set of digital inputs, uh, basically uh, digital input one to five from a relay with address of two, and the D20 address uh, is four, and the preferred uh, communication protocol in this case, uh, let's say it's DMP uh, protocol version X. Uh, the, the reason I'm referring to this as version X, that first the, the, the protocol itself that I'm uh, giving as an example here does not exist. Uh, I'm just giving an oversimplification of a DMP protocol because the DMP protocol contains many features like we're going to explain in the last uh, section of this uh, demonstration. So. A simplification will help our learning to understand uh, what, uh, how a protocol would impact uh, the message being transmitted between one IED to another uh, IED. Um, so uh, if we look at uh, this example, uh, basically the first part of the message would be the identifier of the message. So uh, in a machine language, which is zeros or ones, where zero stands for zero volt and five stands, five volts would stand for the value of one. The first thing that we will take a look at is the hex value 0564, which stands for uh, protocol identifier. Then uh, in the same message, we will have the PROM address. In this case, it's hex four. Um, after that will come the two address, which is hex two. Um, and uh, every message would have a functional code. So the functional code in this case is hex one or hex value one. Um, and like I said earlier, we're asking for a starting point one all the way to the ending point five. And that every message would have a cyclic redundancy check or a message check in it. Um, I mean, I'm giving one, two, three, four, probably it's gonna be uh, some mathematical formula that calculates the message uh, equation uh, for CRC. So in this case, um, that message would translate into 05, 64, 04, 02, 01, 01, 05, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is the full uh, message in hex. Now, this hex message would be then translated into machine language, uh, ones and zeros that would be transmitted over the wire 
uh, as we said earlier, uh, using the voltage sensing levels of zero to five and translated at the other end in the same manner from a voltage level into bits and bytes and into a meaningful message for the device to take the appropriate action. Before we start to talk about the uh, history of uh, uh, protocols, um, with the advent of new communication uh, standards uh, after the protocols, the new standards rely on combining uh, best protocols to achieve efficiency and improve the functionality. So the latest standards, for example, the 61850 standard, um, if we want to uh, communicate a protocol like MMS over uh, TSCP IP in order to achieve uh, communication uh, of data uh, over a physical uh, network setup, um, basically the message will consist of MMS message including envelope in, in a TCP IP message. Uh, let's say we have a trigger that we have to deliver this, uh, an alarm takes place and we have to deliver uh, this alarm from one device to the other. So this trigger would be then, uh, would start the application layer that would generate the MMS uh, message. And once the MMS message is ready, it will be uh, enveloped or embedded into a TCP IP message and then the TCP IP message would be transmitted on the wire like we've shown you earlier uh, using uh, whatever physical encoding uh, required and then at the other end it will be that physical encoding will be decoded and the TCP IP layer would check the message for integrity once that message is found to be a, a good message it would be transmitted to the next layer which is the MMS uh, message the MMS application layer that would translate uh, this message and then would apply the appropriate uh, action uh, based on the message received uh, this uh, would achieve basically uh, major uh, efficiency at every layer. So the MMS application would be very efficient and object oriented and allow for a lot of features. And instead of combining all the layers into a single application and then the application would become overwhelmed uh, and less uh, would have less features like if it was a single application handling TCP IP and MMS and uh, all layer, uh, then it will be it it will be more difficult for that application to handle all of these aspects. So this will give more granularity per application in order to provide uh, a, a rich features uh, in in the each protocol layer, and then the standard will combine the best protocols with all the features in order to provide the end user. Uh, with, the, with the most efficient uh, setup to achieve uh, reliable communication in a substation and efficient communication. In this uh, history section, we're going to discuss three topics. First, how did the protocol uh, development uh, start? Next, uh, the need for interoperability. And finally, we're going to discuss the new system architecture. Communication between devices was created by IED vendors. Uh, vendors were trying their best to make sure that the communication protocol will serve the required functionality between uh, the IEDs in a very efficient and uh, compact manner. Um, saying that some of the protocols requirement uh, were uh, less than other protocol requirements. So what I mean by that is uh, one device requirement may be just to report uh, digital inputs and no need for analog input reporting. And uh, some devices would have to report uh, digital inputs and analog inputs. Uh, what this caused is that many uh, different versions of the same protocols were created. And for example, the protocol like um, Modbus, uh, which was created by uh, a company and, and uh, 
then was distributed and became widely adopted because of the simplicity of the Modbus uh, protocol where it doesn't have uh, time in it and it's only reporting data. But even as it reports data, uh, some devices follow the, the, if you like, the unwritten rules of the protocol and some devices uh, created their own flavor or their own version copy of Modbus. Um, and uh, for example, in the D20 uh, device, in our remote terminal unit D20 device, we have about nine different types of Modbus or ten different types of Modbus uh, flavors or a major uh, application because every device that we have interacted with in the field might have had its own little tweak or change. Um, whether it was intentionally done by the IED creators in order to lock in customers or was unintentionally done because not foreseeing the importance of abiding by all the rules because the device requirements is way less, what it ended up being is uh, basically a whole uh, big database of uh, applications that we utilize in our uh, and protocols that we utilize in our SCADA implementation in many devices around the substations and uh, that uh, that diversity in uh, protocols or these proprietary uh, protocols uh, have caused uh, major uh, issues for utilities who are trying to standardize among uh, these protocols. So between the 1920s to the 1980s, um, some protocols, the, some proprietary protocols gained a wide acceptance and was uh, shared between uh, vendors uh, who are sharing the same uh, project. Um, so utilities uh, around the 1980s uh, started to request interoperability among uh, vendors and uh, open protocols started to appear in the market. Uh, the open protocol could be uh, one of two things, either uh, a vendor who has created a, a good protocol like DMP was created by GE, uh, was published and then adopted by an uh, international committee, uh, international standard committee, and then it was, uh, uh, there was many laboratories created to provide certification for anybody claiming that they talk DMP, or it was initially created by a, a, a certification body or a committee uh, that, that uh, made it uh, available in public like uh, the 6870-5-101, 102, 103, and 104, and uh, then made it uh, available also to laboratories that would certify um, the, the device uh, talking. Now, saying that not all devices requirements is the same. So for example, let's say a device is a, just a simple relay and does not require all the functionality that comes in DMP. So it doesn't comply to DMP level three, it complies to DMP level one. Uh, it still talks DMP, but it doesn't talk all the opcode or functionality that is available in, uh, in the DMP uh, protocol. So that, that's basically um, also had a little bit of variance in the way the protocol is communicated and uh, configured, which is uh, also a challenge for uh, the, the end consumer or the utilities on um, the, the, the interoperability of devices within the same uh, within the same open protocol, uh, as such, there was uh, a requirement for an overall uh, standardization by the end customer, by the consumer, in order to make sure that uh, these devices can be integrated in a smoother uh, setup in, uh, when, uh, during a project uh, implementation. 
So international standardization bodies started to form committees to standardize protocol implementation in substations. Uh, new system architectures governing uh, IED communication in the substation and remote communication uh, started to appear. Uh, for example, uh, we have the UCA protocol. Uh, UCA stands for Universal Communications Architecture, uh, which was the protocol that's a predecessor to the existing uh, most wide adopted protocol, which is 61A, uh, most wide adopted standard, sorry, which is 61850 standard. Uh, that's basically the substation automation uh, standard. And um, in the 61850, like I said earlier, they adopted the layering or what they call as a 61850 stack. And this 61850 stack would define what's the application layer and what application would control, would uh, define what application protocol would define the physical or the, the, the uh, session layer. So uh, it basically took the best practices out of all the older or the available protocols in the market and standardized what should be used for relay communication, what should be used for um, a concentrator uh, communication. And they're trying to uh, define how the devices should interact among each other, whether these devices exist in a substation or one substation to another, one substation to control center. In this final section, we're going to discuss the communication protocol classifications. Uh, basically, two topics. We'll cover the types of protocols and the protocol features and functionalities uh, as another way of classifying protocols. So, we can divide the protocols into three families. Uh, we've got the closed protocols like Modbus, Conatel, LNG 8979, or uh, an open protocol family like DMP, IEC 6870-5-101, 102, 103, 104, or we can put them in a standard uh, like the UCA standard or the 61850, regardless of the protocol that we want to use. At the end of the day, there is information that's transforming or that is uh, traveling from one device to another device. And in, the, uh, in this transportation of information, uh, we need a way for one device to understand the information that's coming from another device. We also have the other requirements, which is ease of configuration efficiency in communication and uh, uh, no loss of data. Uh, so like I discussed in other modules in, uh, in this uh, uh, substation automation is um, different protocols will give you different features and depending on um, these features that would categorize the protocol um, as uh, acceptable to uh, the end application that the utility or the user wants to achieve or it's not applicable. Networks that are specific to one manufacturer and which work with specific hardware connections and protocols are called closed systems. Usually these systems and technologies are dated and were developed at a time before standardization or when it was considered unlikely or not desirable to have equipment from other manufacturers included in the network. In many of these dated configurations, a single device acts as a protocol translator that collects data from different devices in the field using a variety of protocols, hence the term protocol translator. The purpose of the data collection is to build up or concentrate the data in one area for storage, monitoring, and control purposes. The data concentrator relays the data back and forth between the field devices, an operator interface, and data storage devices with inherent delays. The term data concentrator refers to a device that performs this function. Open systems are those communication networks that conform to specifications and guidelines which are open to all. This allows equipment from any manufacturer who claims to comply with a particular standard to be used interchangeably on this network. This provides the end users with many choices of equipment suppliers. 
The network standard being open will tend to be updated on a frequent basis to take advantage of the latest, widely available, and cost-effective hardware and software technologies. The optimal configuration would have all devices directly connected to the LAN, eliminating the need for a relaying device such as a data concentrator and its associated delays. The support of high-speed LAN interfaces is now more common with the increase in power of modern microprocessor-based devices. One of the most important features of a communication system is the need for a common set of rules in order for both the receiver and transmitter to understand each other. This is referred to as the need for compatibility. There are three issues associated with compatibility. The first issue is the pure physical connection standard. The second is the existence of complementary software standards at the transmitter and receiver, which are used in conjunction with the physical standards to make a complete communication system. The third issue is the conformability of the physical connection and software to the Open System Interconnect Model, or OSI model. There are seven worldwide organizations which are involved in drawing up standards or recommendations affecting data communications. When one of these organizations creates a new standard, the name of this organization appears as part of the name of the new standard. Faced with the proliferation of closed network systems, in 1978, the International Standards Organization defined a reference model for communication between open systems, which is called the Open System Interconnection Model. This model is composed of seven layers. Each layer has a defined purpose and interfaces with the layer above and below it. Let's take a look at the role of each layer. The physical layer includes elements involved with the actual transmission and reception of signals such as physical connections between the device and the network, network topology, electrical aspects of signaling voltages and currents, for example, which voltage levels are considered a logic 1 and logic 0, in addition to how much current the transmitter must be capable of supplying. Signal modulation technique. For example, is it a simple on-off technique or FM or AM, etc. Mechanical aspects such as the connectors and physical medium to be used. In utility and industrial power system applications, the most commonly used physical layer standards are RS-232, RS-423, RS-485, 10100 base T and 10100 base F Ethernet. We will learn about these standards in depth in the following sections of this course. The data link layer provides the services that allow communication between devices. This includes framing or separation of messages, error detection and correction mechanism, and an addressing mechanism. While the data link is concerned with a direct exchange of frames among devices on a single communications channel, the network layer is responsible for device-to-device -device data delivery and optimal routing across multiple data links. These underlying layers might result in packets that are delivered out of sequence, missing, corrupted, or delayed due to lower layer communication issues. To address this, the transport layer provides a guaranteed delivery messaging service that ensures the data is error-free and correctly sequenced, allowing process-to-process -process communications between devices across a network or multiple networks. The session layer provides a mechanism for the establishment of a communication session between applications running within the devices, while the presentation layer ensures the correct translation of data. The application layer provides the facilities or interface to allow the applications protocols or drivers, such as Modbus or DNP, to use the network. In other words, in order to uh, look at the capability of a protocol, there is uh, many, um, I'll give some examples of these capabilities. For example, can the protocol support serial or it will support network or maybe it will support both serial and network. Um, can, if, if the protocol supports network, is it only local capability? I mean, is it close to the substation or uh, close to one network or can it talk on a broadcast network or can it talk outside of the substation on an internet uh, communication what does that entail when it comes to security and uh, firewalls and gateways and what kind of gateways is required that would be a feature of the uh, protocol um, the, the some of the uh, most important evaluation when we look at a protocol is can the protocol transmit time and uh, what is the precision of time that is used is it every second every millisecond 
And the other thing is, does the protocol have the year or doesn't have the year specified in every message that that would impact the efficiency of the protocol. So if you say, well, I would like to see the year and the decade, that will make the protocol and each message of the protocol bigger. So you might lose efficiency, but will include will improve the precision. At the same time, if if we don't include the time, then the messages will will be very very compact, and uh, it will be left up to the devices to decide on the sequence of events of these messages and how to uh, log these messages and the time uh, for these messages. So it all depends on the philosophy that we would like to implement when it comes to time. Uh, what kind of data does the protocol support and is, is it uh, required for our implementation? Maybe it only supports digital analogs or does it have counters or it doesn't have counters? Uh, including uh, included in this data and what precision of data is there is it a 12 bit 16 bit 64 bit and uh, will that serve our need uh, for that uh, for the implementation of that protocol or standard in the substation um, can uh, the protocol report uh, interchanges interstates um, for example, let's say uh, we've set up this protocol or the, the polling in our substation to happen every uh, two seconds and uh, we, there is an inter, uh, interchanges that it took place between the polling. So does the protocol has the capability to report these interchanges? Uh, let's say at the first polling the data was the digital input was zero and then, and, and then it changed to one and then it changed to zero before the second uh, polling uh, came. Will the protocol report that interstate of one took place intermittently between the polling? Is that important to us? Um, in some of the modules I explained the uh, debouncing and all of that, so maybe it's, it's best to ignore these interim states or it's important that we know about these interim states because that might flag something. And last but not least, of course, is two things, security and redundancy. So do we need a, does the protocol support if there is a firewall? Maybe once we put a firewall in our network, that protocol will no more be communicated uh, or that message doesn't go beyond a, a gateway. Um, does the protocol uh, support the redundancy? Can it be communicated uh, via two paths to the other side? Um, all of these are features of uh, protocols and features of standards that will play a very important role on whether we adopt these protocols, whether we implement these protocols. In the industry, there is many philosophies when it comes to um, which protocol will stay, which protocol will disappear over time. Um, there is a philosophy that say that serial protocols will be around for decades to come because of the number of devices that exist in our substations with serial, uh, with serial communication ability. And uh, there is philosophies that say that um, serial communication will disappear and there will be only one standard uh, in the world of SCADA. Hopefully that, that will happen one day where we have only one standard governing our uh, electrical uh, systems. Uh, until uh, that time, uh, I hope you have a good uh, overview of uh, the diversity of proto protocols in our SCADA system and uh, what is a protocol and uh, we'll see you in future modules. Mm -hmm.